Maranatha. 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 Friends, let us give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. And his mercies endureth forever. My wife and I cannot express adequately in words our joy and happiness to be with you on this bright Sabbath day. We want to thank our colleagues, our friends, and our counterparts, Pastor and his wife. And we also want to thank our elders in this church for this special opportunity. Shall we bow in prayer? Merciful Father, we want to thank you for your holy Sabbath and the blessings it affords us. We want to thank you for this fellowship. We invite your Holy Spirit to imbue our hearts and our minds. May it please you, dear Lord, to strengthen us. That we will not be mere hearers of your word to deceive ourselves. But that we will be doers of your word. Enable us to apply your word in our lives and in the end, by your grace, save us into your kingdom, for you have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. As the Ministerial Secretary of the West Central Africa Division, part of my responsibilities has been to deal with the welfare of pastors, their wives, and their children, and also to take care of our able elders who serve as the right-hand persons of our pastors. It is not only for me to facilitate the learning of our pastors, but also to role model for them and to be a worthy example unto them as they seek to share the gospel among church members. Throughout 2019, the trust of my message to my pastors and to my elders in West Central African Division had been to what extent are we appropriating the grace, the privileges, the opportunities that the Lord bring our way. And so this morning, I want to stretch the same message, reminding us that the Lord has blessed us and he has expectations of us. And so I've titled my message, Common Sense Pragmatism. Common Sense Pragmatism. Now, if you break it down, what I want to say, what I want to draw attention to is those things that should come naturally to us without going to school, without anybody telling you. Those things as Christians should be part of us naturally. Those things which, if indeed we are seven-day Adventists, then we don't need anybody to tell us, but it should come naturally to us. Those things we should, out of common sense, do on a daily basis. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ told many parables, and he told these parables to illustrate his expectations of us in terms of our stewardship. This morning, I am more than tickled that having been told and having its stress that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And then we have the luxury of receiving, giving us the opportunity to give so as to benefit from the knowledge and the lesson that we have received. I think we can say our children are children. Perchance, are we adults the same? Having been convinced that it is more blessed to give 
than to receive. At which end of the spectrum do we find ourselves? Are we givers or are we receivers? And so Christ, as he told these parables, he tried to illustrate his expectations of us in terms of our stewardship. He did not leave us to chance. And so this morning, I want us to consider a classical parable of Jesus Christ as found in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Please turn with me in your Bible. And here I want to indicate that the point of the parable is that we should not just manage and keep what is entrusted to us, but that also we are to find ways to develop and add to what has been entrusted to us in order to bless others. So Matthew 25. 14, 15, we read, a man was leaving and entrusted each of his three servants some valuables. In fact, the Bible says he entrusted his property to them. To one of them, he gave five talents, five talents of money. To another, he gave two talents and to another one talent. And scripture says, each was given according to his or her ability. Friends, do you suppose the Lord knows our abilities? Being our creator, do you suppose he knows what you are capable of and what I am capable of? And we are told the man left on a journey. Verse 16, the one giving five, we are told, worked and got five more, making how many? How many? Ten. He put his talents to maximum use. And then, verse 17, we are told that the one with two also worked with his talent and he got two more. But verse 18, we read that the one who was given one according to his abilities went and hid his talent in a dark hole. Instead of working with his talent, he dug a hole and hid his talent. Verse 19, the master returns. And he demanded probity and accountability from all three of them. Verse 20, we read, The one with five came and reported, Sir, you gave me five. Here, I have gained five more. The response of the master, verse 21, Well done, faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. In other words, he was no longer a steward. He had been made a shareholder. At this point, my question is, what kind of report will you be presenting to Master Jesus when he returns? Verse 22, the man with two also read his report, and he said he gained two more. The response and the reaction of the master was the same as to the one who had gained five more. Very interesting. It is like they were graded the same. Well done, faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Here again, we see a promotion from stewardship to a shareholder. 
Verse 24. The man who had received one talent came. In giving his report, he said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Verse 26 and 27, the response of the master, wicked, lazy servant, why not the bank? From your testimony and from your report, if you are serious, why not the bank? Verse 28, take it and give to the one who had ten. Then verse 29. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have abundance. Whoever does not have, excuse me, even what he has will be taken from him. Thirty. Worthless servant, cast him into darkness. Worthless servant, cast him into darkness. We say, as we study theology, like all other professions, we have areas of specialization. We have those who specialize in biblical studies, like the Old Testament, they study the Hebrew, Hebrew exegesis, and we have the New Testament scholars who do Greek and the Greek exegesis. We have also those who try to harmonize the Old Testament and the New Testament. We, we, we refer to them as the systematic theologians. And then we have those missiologists who are interested in church planting and how to grow churches. And then we have a branch referred to as applied theology. We answer the question, so what? <coughs> Excuse me. A man was traveling. He gave talents to three servants, and they gave reports. And so what? <coughs> In other words, what has that got to do with you and me today? In our practice as Seventh-day Adventists, what should be the benefit from the Bible as we read it? And I belong to the Applied Theology group. And so this morning, what I intend to do with you with this parable is to do the application as it relates to you, as it relates to you, as it relates to me. Be you a pastor, be you an elder of the church, be you a deacon, be you an ordinary church member. What has this parable got to do with us in our today contemporary practice and lives as Seventh-day Adventists? Now, my friends, I want you to understand from the outset that the master's approval of the faithful stewards was not proportionate to the amount of profit in each case. It didn't matter whether you made five more or you made two more, but rather it was proportionate to the faithfulness that was displayed. I say it was proportionate to what? The faithfulness that the steward displayed. And so when you come to think of it, when the, God, when the Lord comes and he, he wants to deal with us in terms of accountability, whether you are a pastor, whether you are an elder, whether you are a deacon, whether you are a chorister, will not be so much what will matter to him. But what will really, really matter to him is what you did in the capacity you found yourself. In other words, the reward for faithfulness in service was to be an increased opportunity to serve. In our practical contemporary situation, it should be after you have been a faithful attendant of Sabbath school, 
then you'll be made a Sabbath school teacher. And then when you demonstrate your faithfulness as a Sabbath school teacher, then you may be made a Sabbath school secretary. And then when you do well as a Sabbath school secretary, you will be asked to serve as the Sabbath school superintendent. And when we see that you are a faithful Sabbath school superintendent and under your watch Sabbath school is growing and people are, are learning the lessons and, and our sense of spirituality is improving, then you will be made an elder of the church. But sometimes you get situations where people are not performing in the small corner where they are and still they want to be entrusted with bigger and heavier responsibilities. This morning, my friends, I want to remind you that the reward for faithfulness in service was to be an increased opportunity to serve. And therefore, if you want to have a bigger space of responsibility, then brighten the corner where you are. In other words, simply put, the use made of lesser opportunity is the measure of the ability to take advantage of greater opportunities. In our area in pastoral ministry, it is expected that when you have done well in your local church, when you have served well as a district pastor and you have things that is bringing progress to your district, then you will be sent to the conference so other district pastors can learn and benefit from your skills and your experience. And when you have done well at the conference level, you will be sent to the union so that other conferences can learn from you. And then when you have done well at the conference, at the conference level, you go to the union, from the union to the division, and hopefully to the general conference. But more often than not, you find a pastor under whose watch the district is dying, politicking and fighting hard to be sent to the conference. Only one wonders what he wants to go and do at the conference. Sometimes you have church members who are waiting to be married. And then when, it is the, when they are married, then the church can see what they can do for the church. Some are waiting to be baptized. And when they are baptized, that is the time we will see that they really have the spiritual gifts. Some are waiting to be rich. And that's when the church will know they can do something for the Lord. My dear friends, why do you think the servant who was given one talent hid his money? I wish to submit to you that the negligent servant, he lacked common sense. He lacked common sense in the sense that the master asked him, why not the bank? He could not think of the bank where you will not need to work, but still there was the possibility of adding value to what has been entrusted to you. In that dark hole, what if some rat or some rabbit had reached that money? Sometimes you have church leaders who cannot think of providing even decent receptacles for collecting Sabbath school offering. I don't know in your experience, and of course in your church here, I see it's different. But I've been to churches where when it's time to collect the offering, they open the record book and they pass it around. As if the Sabbath school offering is no more a sacred offering. In my practice and experience as a minister, I have gone to homes where I've seen pastors watching things deteriorate to nonsense point. I have even been to churches where things are deteriorating and pastors and their members are simply oblivious as to what can be done to improve the situation. This man lacked common sense. Not only that, he was a coward by his own admission. He said he was afraid. Afraid of what? And scripture tells us in Revelation 21 verse 8 that cowards will not go to heaven. 
I say, who will not go to heaven? Cowards will not go to heaven. There are some people who have all kinds of reasons why they are not doing their duty. There are some people who have all kinds of reasons why in a small church like this, they cannot accept responsibility. Always giving excuses and reasons why they should be left alone. My dear church member, why do you refuse to do what you are supposed to do? Who are you afraid of? What is hindering you from using your spiritual gifts? You see, this foolish steward was afraid that an unsuccessful business venture not only might earn no result or interest, but could result in the loss of the capital invested in it. There are some people, the only reason they are not making progress, they are fearful of possible failure. The negligent servant I want to submit this morning was spiritually bankrupt. Spiritually bankrupt in the sense that he thought only of the material profit and forgot the less tangible, but no less the real rewards that will accrue to him as a result of faithful service. There are some of us who are oblivious of the blessings of the Lord, the protection that we enjoy day after day on these dangerous roads, that we are not mocked by thieves, that we are not boggled and disturbed in the night by armed robbers, we take all of these things for granted. There are some of us who are in this church only for material things. There are some who think of power, authority, and opposition in the church. Not long ago, a veteran church elder came to me and said, Pastor, this pastor of mine, a young pastor, I don't know. I don't know the kind of training he received in the seminary. He just came and he said, I've been an elder for too long and he has engineered and this year I have not been returned as the first elder. But pastor, as you see me, as you know me, my spiritual gift is church leadership. So now that I'm not a church elder, what am I going to do in this church? So for him, church is all about position. You have encountered elders who, when they were not returned as elders, they said the robes they bought for the choir, they wanted back. The band they bought for the AY, they wanted back. Why? Because they had not been returned as elders of the church. Such people have no spiritual death to see the spiritual reward that comes to us as we faithfully serve the Lord. Those rewards that we receive as a result of faithful service to the Lord and to his church. This guy was wicked and selfish. And his mind, he thought any prophet would go to his master. He was unwilling to accept the responsibilities involved and he would do the same where a larger opportunity offered him. My friends, can you imagine if at the outset this guy had been given ten talents and he had gone to hit the ten talents? Imagine the loss he would have caused this master if he had out of fear hidden ten talents, if that was what was given to him. And sometimes as I minister to pastors, I tell them, there are some pastors who should never be entrusted with leadership responsibilities in our churches. Due to the financial laws and the material laws, some calls to our churches. For there are some people who should never be made elders of any local church. If we do not want 
losses to be accrued to the church. My point is that he was not only a coward, he was also wicked and selfish. My dear church member, do you do it only when it benefits you? There are some people in the church, the only time they will take any responsibility is after they have calculated and they know that in the end it is going to fill their pockets. What if it will not benefit you? There are some local church elders. When it is their department, there is money, there is budgetary allocation. But when it is others, there is no money. Sometimes you get some elders, they are thinking of only their small family life ministry or only their small women ministries programs. You mention the youth, there is no money. You talk about the choir, they are not interested. Their interest is only where they are involved, where they benefit. Now, about those who fail and put the blame on the master. Such are put to shame by those who work and succeed. Can you, can, can you, can you listen one more time to this useless steward as he described his master? This unproductive servant sounded very intelligent, very brilliant, eloquent, and verbose in his utterances and assessment of the master, in his own myopic understanding of life. He is the typical empty barrel that makes the most noise. This person reminds me of a few scenarios from my many years of teaching. Sometimes you go to class and you see this beautiful lady, very beautiful lady. They are the type, if you are not careful and you don't concentrate on your lecture notes, before you know, you, you are making no sense. You, you, you will be mesmerized by their looks. A few times I returned from the lectures to my house and I would tell my wife, hey, madam, as for this semester, the girls, it's not easy. He says, it's up to you. Are you there to teach or to look at the girls? <laughs> but the point I'm making is that sometimes some of these ladies, you, you know that they are the handiwork of God. Until you give a quiz or an exam and then you take the paper and you look at the answer and you begin to wonder. So there is no correlation between the beauty and the brain. Sometimes you get some of these pastors who come from the field to upgrade themselves in the school. And they talk and they preach and they have answers to everything. Sometimes you wonder why they did not allow them to stay in the field but to come back to school until you give a quiz or an examination. And then you see that this pastor is an empty barrel and that coming back to school is the place for him to be. But for the two other stewards who were successful with the talents that they were given, we would have bought into the lies of this lazy, do-nothing steward. But it was the same master. And he gave to each one of them according to his ability. Once again, can you imagine if erroneously this master had given the lazy steward ten talents? My dears, there are many people with large capacities and abilities who accomplish very little because they attempt little. There is a philosopher, a renowned Ghanaian philosopher, Dr. Kweji Agri. He says, as Africans, we achieve very little because we set our goals so low. Right from the start, we discount ourselves. We cannot. It's not possible. 
I'm highly, highly impressed by the goal you have set yourselves in building a befitting tabernacle for the Lord. My prayers will be with you. And whenever and however possible, you will have my support, not only in mere words, but also financially. I think the goal you have set yourself it's a laudable goal. And with commitment, with dedication, the Lord will bless your efforts. What goals have you set yourself as an individual? As the first elder of this church, as the ministerial secretary of the division, as the head deaconess of this church, as the leader of the children's ministry of this church, what goal have you set for yourself? What goals do you have for your marriage? For your children? For your church? And for your workplace? You see, this unprofitable steward had been derelict in his duty, a fact he freely admitted. Simply put, his failure was deliberate and premeditated, and therefore he must bear the responsibility for the failure. And here, friends, I want to make the point that we are not going to go scot-free if we are guilty of negligence, if we are guilty of laziness, if we are guilty of being lackadaisical in our duties. Friends, we are not going scot-free. What happens to our talents if we do nothing with them? Scripture says they get taken away. The Lord will take it away from us. So my dear friend, my dear pastor, my dear elder, my dear church member, what are you doing for this church, this seven-day Adventist church, that you so much love? What are you doing with the talents, the privileges, the opportunities that the Lord has blessed you with? Always remember that opportunities and resources one person refuses are given to another who will take advantage of them. To what extent are you faithful to your giftedness as blessed by the Lord. Very quickly, I want to give you tidbits from my personal experience so as to awaken in you the possibility of looking out for what you can be doing so as to add value to what the Lord has blessed you with. I was a student in the seminary. And I took a course in chaplaincy. And then one day during the lectures, our professor said that in the Seventh-day Adventist Church globally, we had military chaplains, Seventh-day Adventist pastors who were serving as military chaplains only in the USA and Canada. At the end of the lecture, I asked, why is it that it's only the USA and Canada that we have military chaplains? He said, well, the church did not want to put pastors in harm's way, and they are not sure of the situation, the political situations in other places, and that is why. I was not convinced, and I said, in Ghana, where I come from, Seventh-day Adventist Church is well known and we have a lot of military officers and military personnel. And I believe they will need a Seventh-day Adventist military chaplain. He said, Daniel, don't worry. In two weeks, the chaplain general of the general conference is visiting campus. That was Andrews University. When he comes, I will arrange for you to have a talk with him. Two weeks, the chaplain general came, and my professor arranged for me to meet him. I dialogued with him, and I insisted Ghana 
could also have a military chaplain, he advised me to write to the Ghana Armed Forces and ask about the situations there and the conditions for having a seven-day Adventist military chaplain. After two weeks, I received no response. Those days, there were no emails. There were no cell phones. Three weeks, no response. So I went back to my professor. He said, Daniel, write again. And this time, he helped me to put ginger, garlic, and pepper in the letter. I said that I was a Ghanaian studying abroad. I had full confidence in the Ghana Armed Forces. And I have written to them, and for almost four weeks, I have not heard from them. What kind of embarrassment is that? In two weeks, I receive a response from the Chaplain General of the Ghana Armed Forces. Among other things, he said, Daniel, we are happy about your enthusiasm. But as at the time of writing, I want you to know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not listed among the recognized churches in the Ghana Armed Forces. Until the situation changes, we want you to keep hope alive. Jesus Christ. So all along, our church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, was not recognized by the Ghana Armed Forces. And so action began at the GC, the Chaplain General, that time Pastor M. A. Bediakun, who used to be the Executive Secretary of the General Conference, was a Ghanaian at the GC. Pastor J.J. Norte was our Division President. Pastor P.K. Asari, my Union President. They all began working hard in getting the Seventh-day Adventist Church registered and recognized in the Ghana Armed Forces. And friends, I'm happy to tell you that Ghana became the first country outside the USA and Canada to have a seven-day Adventist military chaplain. It all started in a classroom where I was not the lecturer but a student. I'm talking about opening your minds into conceiving possibilities of adding value to the church. When I finished my doctoral studies, I was sent to Valley View University as a professor in the theology department. In my first class, it was Daniel studies in Daniel, as we are doing this quarter. I found two students who, in my estimation, were about three times more brilliant than I was when I was at their age and at their level. So after the class, I recommended to the university that they should be sponsored for further studies up to the doctorate level so they could come back and teach. The argument was, they have not finished school. Why are you talking about sponsoring them? These guys finished school. And by that time, I was the head of the theology department. So I made a case for them. They said, well, the policy says that even if they qualify to be sponsored, they must work for the university for at least three years. I became the acting academic dean of the university, so I could make the case to the board. And so the three year was waived, and they were sent for further studies. When they finished their master's and they were to do their doctorate, the university wrote back that they had not had any failed experience, and therefore they should come back to have failed experience. After that, they can come for the doctorate. I was then the acting president of the university, so I wrote to this university and said that they should give them the training we want them to receive, and when they come back, we will ensure that they have the requisite field training. My dear friends, I am not yet retired, but as I speak to you, one of them is currently the vice chancellor of the university. And he is the youngest vice chancellor in the history of Ghana, both in the private and the public universities. I'm talking about opening your minds to possibilities and things you can do. 
This is my second concranium at the division as a ministerial secretary. I was given a local church like your church here. And then I realized that throughout the division, especially at the headquarters, we do not have an attorney, a local lawyer, an Ivorian lawyer. You, a local church, you are blessed with a lawyer here. And my learned friend, thank you very much for your passion for this church. I was impressed by his enthusiasm to ensure that we get to you today. May the good Lord bless you, my friend. And I realized that we did not have even a single lawyer. So inside my local church, I decided to find two worthy children and help them to study law. I discovered a sister, two sisters. So when the elder one finished school and was going to the university, I asked her to do law. I sponsored her law for the first degree, and she began the master's degree. And currently, she's doing a PhD in Montipé. I can't pronounce that name in France. Montipé. The number one law school, law university in France. The sister is currently finishing her first degree. And if all things should go well, she should join the sister. And when my work is done at the division, that will be my gift to Côte d'Ivoire the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Côte d'Ivoire, two professional lawyers. Two more, and I will finish. I went to a place to work, and in the conference, the driver who picked me from the airport and who sent me to the airport, a young man, brilliant young man, so I asked him, why, why are you a driver? Is that all you can do? And here, I'm not disparaging the fact of driving, but what I'm saying is that as he was driving these pastors in and out, didn't he feel called also to be a pastor? He said, Pastor, you know, I am married, I have four children, and my salary cannot support studies in the seminary. I gave him my calling card, and I said, I'm from Valley View University. Give me a call. Write to me, and we will see what will happen. My dear friends, today he is serving as an executive secretary of one of the fields in Côte d'Ivoire. No longer driving pastors in and out. He is a pastor in his own right. I went to work in eastern Nigeria, and in the guest house of the union, there was this young man who will come and be sweeping and sometimes will want to know if I have something to iron and things. He was the handyman. I said, ah, young man. So you, what are you doing? Are you not going to school? What, what, what are you doing in this hotel here? He said, sir, I would like to study uh, theology and become a pastor. But I understand the, the school fees at Babcock University it's too expensive. And so they are thinking of opening a seminary in Clifford University right here in my union. And when it's open, I plan to go there. I said, Babcock, how much do they charge? He said, I don't know. So how do you know it's expensive? <laughs> I told him to apply to Babcock. If he gets admission, he should find out how much it will cost and he should let me know. Clifford University now has a theology department, but this year it is in the third year. But last June, this young man graduated with a BA theology from Babcock University. Sometimes when we talk of the church as a family, we become narrow and we think of only our mononuclear families, me, my wife, and my children. But in the church, there should be no child here without a father. There should be no child here without a mother. There should be no mother here. There, there should be no adult lady or adult man here without a child.
And therefore, I support your venture. That you don't want to be in this Chinese edifice. That you want to have your own edifice. It is like the Lord entrusting you with five talents when he has given others one talent. Consider this challenge as talents that the Lord has entrusted to you. And believe, believe the word of God that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And the Lord says when you give and he is giving back, it's full measure that is pressed down, shaking and overflowing. So when he gives you five and you demonstrate tenacity and faithfulness, you no longer remain a steward. You become a shareholder. And that is what is going to happen to us if we remain faithful to the Lord. He said he is preparing mansions for us. When he is done, he is coming back to take accountability. He is coming to take our reports. And those who will be adjudged faithful, he says, and where I am, there ye may be also. Amen. So my dear friends, the way of becoming efficient, effective, and productive as church members and stewards of God is to learn to use, develop, and improve our talents, to improve our knowledge and our skills and by accepting and taking on challenges like the one you have taken upon yourselves as a church. May the good Lord, who has called us out of utter darkness, into his marvelous light, the gracious Lord, who has entrusted us with his talents and the care for his church and the propagation of the gospel, the one who bid us to add value to his heritage. May this gracious Lord endow us. May he enable us to live and work according to his will in such a way that will bring progress and added value to his church. May he bless our efforts with resounding success. In the end, may we be saved into his kingdom, for I've prayed in Jesus' name. Amen.